students, the guests, welcome to our joint seminar, Global Challenges to Development. This course is a partnership between the Global Awareness Education at the University of Tübingen in Germany, State University of Maringa in Brazil, and the Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. In this course, we will alternate theoretical debates with students' projects related to sustainability, education, creative industries, geopolitical instabilities, and health. We will have guests from different countries and contexts who will contribute with lectures and discussions to these topics. In both universities, the course is offered to students of different disciplines, in Tübingen as part of the Global Awareness Education in the Transdisciplinary Course Program, and at the State University of Maringa as a free extension course. The course organizers are Professor Mauricio Reinhardt and Professor Sara Pichet, State University of Maringa, Professor Ronan Nakwadi, Nelson Mandela University, and me, Klausa Perez da Silva, University of Tübingen. Today, we will have a roundtable with two guests who will talk about the global challenges to development in practice, Natalia Krieg and Juan Marmor. I would like to present our guests. Natalia Krieg is an economist with over 10 years history of working in the financial industry, former Citigroup analyst, currently a principal evaluator at the Multilateral Developmental Investment Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, on a second mint at the International Monetary Fund. Research areas are bank performance and resolution mechanisms, financial stability, development outcome, and crisis evaluation. Juan Mamua is agricultural engineer specialized in water resources and irrigation drainage engineering with 20 years of experience in designing and implementing water resources plans and irrigation investment projects, modeling water resources and conducting hydrological studies. He's currently working at the AHT Group. So our um, Roundtable, we will start with Natalia Creek's presentation, followed by Juan Marmol's presentation. And after that, we will have our Q&A session and we have the opportunity to discuss further with our guests. So thank you for joining us. And now the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor. And, and thank you so much, students, for, 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 uh, for being here. And um, I hope you can see my slides uh, in a full screen setup now. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was a student not that long ago, and, uh, and obviously being here on the other side is also a very happy moment for me that I don't have to go through the reading list as you do. Uh, I did share some of my readings, which were articles, because I wanted to make your life easier after so many classes. I heard you have a lot of very interesting discussion with other professors. Um, so I hope you probably wonder at this stage how I'm going to use it in real life when I finish to this, this modules um, and, and enter the real world of working. So that's my role here is to share some experience of me who I've worked in multiple organizations, uh, but here today I will be talking mostly about multinational development bank uh, I'm working for at the moment, European Bank for Reconstruction Development. But because I'm also at the context of IMF, I wanted to broader the umbrella and cover all of the IFIs uh, and attempt to uh, bring you some um, issues for discussions on the global development challenges together with Juan. Hopefully we'll have some nice discussions among each other. Uh, and obviously, obviously, everything I will say here today, obviously, it's my own views, not, it doesn't represent the views of the ERD or of IMF. So just to structure, I've been told I have 20 minutes. Uh, I hope we have some Q&A. Please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. I, I'm, you know, obviously, I'm not the professor, so you, you can stop me at any time you wish. I will start with giving you an overview of the IFIs because I understand you may be hearing those words during the course. I just wanted to give you the landscape overview so maybe the names will make sense where they fit in, in the umbrella of all of the IFIs drill deeper into multinational development bank and provide you examples of real projects um, and how the development is actually shaped uh, in real life and finish quickly with challenges with probably with the other speaker we will have probably a good discussion among each other about uh, issues and um, the world of multinational uh, lenders face today. So let me start with give you the overview of, 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 of the landscape. So here you see different types uh, of uh, international financial institutions. So in, in, in people just call it IFIs, insured, and everyone knows who, who what do you mean? Um, I spell out here different institutions. For example, you may think, okay, where World Bank would be fitting in? Uh, so World Bank and IMF are the special ones which were created and the Bretton Woods uh, institutions um, 
uh, battle there in um, after the Second World War in 1944. Um, they were created in order to uh, bring the world to a better place after the uh, the disaster of, of the Second World War, um, and they were the, the the sister organization at the time. So they were all have their own comparative advantages, and they were there for special mission to to build the global financing world. Um, IMF, obviously, as you know, is very much specializing in monetary financial stability, uh, integration between trade, and uh, now actually also doing uh, things on gender mainstreaming and climate change. And World Bank is focusing more on poverty, climate, um, um, and I will talk to you more about this multinational, because it's a multinational bank as well, so I will tell you more about it on the next slides. World Bank also fits in in the multinational development bank, because it's an investment bank with development agenda. Uh, so it's also categorized as MDB. So when we do reviews of different MDBs, World Bank is showing up in the review. Um, my institution sits also on the MDBs, European Bank for Reconstruction Development. Um, I will tell you a lot about it this here today. Uh, it was created in early 1990s um, to uh, help with countries which were initially in the Soviet regime to be fully, fu fully functioning market economies. Now, for example, Poland, the Ukraine were the biggest country of operation. And today the bank is slightly different. And I will tell you more about the evolution of our mandate today. Uh, but also uh, uh, EBRD is a regional bank. So another classification, less likely to be used uh, in the in the world of, of economists. Um, here you have an uh, organization, for example, you may be more familiar, for example, African Development Bank, um, uh, Asian Development Bank fits there. So everything with the regional angle will also be classified as regional development bank. We also have bilateral development banks, which is basically two members uh, doing uh, development financing and other organizations I know less about, but we can maybe learn from each other discussing those. And just I should have mentioned at the beginning that IFIs, they basically, um, they they subject to international law and they've been set up by one than more one than more member countries um, and they are mostly owned by national governments or other institutions um, and they obviously they all have the very different mandate so let me now give you more of a different mandate umbrella with MDB. So MDB is doing deeper in those. I put some scatter picture here. I hope that they make sense to you and may you may have wondered how one differs from the other. I saw you in the description of your course that the new development bank was mentioned. So I, I think that's maybe uh, what you may have read more about. Um, and actually the course description states that they were, it was set up um, almost, I don't know, it, it read, I read it as an alternative to World Bank. So I wonder, does it mean it's supposed to replace World Bank? Actually, in the origination of New Development Bank, uh, which I put the date, it was in 2014, um, they actually wanted to complement what World Bank Group is doing, uh, all, all the other players, um, and they emphasize the collaboration with others in order to show that they work as partners, not as a competitors. Um, the biggest of all of those institutions in terms of volume of investments is European Investment Bank. That's the EU bank, uh, which does obviously lending, it does policy work. Uh, it, it is the bank actually which has the highest uh, volume of green financing and the first in institutions in the world who launch a green bond. Um, other organizations, obviously, I know that we, you have your camera switched off, so probably no one will stop me. But if you do, please raise your hands or put it in the chat box if you want to learn more about any of those organizations. Well, okay, so in, there's, in terms of what brings them together is the toolkit of investment. So they do, uh, all of them do financing and provide advisory services to member countries. Um, they have different mandates. They overlap in terms of the country's coverage. So for example, EBRD will come, will interact in multiple countries together with EIB. And some people think, are we doing the same job where should, we should be additional to each other? But, some, but actually, to some, we are banks, so we do compete in terms of uh, tenure, the, the, the deals of them, the terms conditions we offer to the client. By, by default, when we sign the loan agreement, we are supposed to be additional to each other. So no other lender is providing a specific solution to the client. Um, and also, I, I will mention later, EBRD focus only on private sector. Lots of those players here have more focus on public sector lending. ADB, for example, is doing a lot of public lending. EBRD is very special in this group because it only does private sector. Actually, not only, but in majority as, 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 as per, per our mandate. In terms of the toolkit, uh, EBRD will give you more example. It's a project, obviously, investment. It's like a loan with development agenda, technical assistance projects, and policy work. They are interlinked, and I will explain that later in the presentations. 
in terms of the life cycle of a project, and I think uh, Juan will have interesting discussion about that. So uh, those projects obviously follow procedure. They have to be signed uh, by each of the institutions with their respective uh, counterparty, um, dispersed, repaid, and then completed. And that the completion was important across the whole of project life cycle is obviously to make sure that the money which were provided will provide some good results. And that's there's a very huge importance for results monitoring and evaluation that we, we make sure that the money we provide don't go to the bin. Um, obviously, investment banking will never happen. But here, because of this development outcome agenda is attached to the deal, there is a high likelihood things may go wrong. So that's why it's very important that the, there is a strong results based monitoring evaluation in, in all of every single individual investment or projects carried on by those institutions. Uh, what else I wanted to highlight is China. Actually, I don't know if maybe that was discussed in previous uh, uh, classes. It's one of one of the largest providers um, of financing, um, and it sits as a member of many of those countries. Uh, there were some discussions about um, certain things. New development government, obviously, it's it's the, uh, it's it's very important um, for China uh, as well as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is based in Beijing, set up uh, not that long ago in 2016. Uh, doing mostly quite large scale, very, very, very good in infrastructure investments um, um, in, in their country of operation. Uh, Caribbean Development Bank, actually, maybe because of some interest from some of the students, um, it's obviously it's relatively new um, and only deals uh, works in the Caribbean um, uh, region. Um, and then um, World Bank, obviously, it's a special animal because it does quite a lot. It has different, obviously, uh, sub institutions within itself. Um, I know them also the IFC, which is the Inter International Financial Corporation, which is the private part of World Bank, which does very similar things to what we do. And lots of people actually ju jump the boat. And I'm currently in Washington, D.C. wondering maybe I should go to IFC now, <laughs> because at the end of the day, we do very similar things in very similar kinds of operation. So on that, I think it's everything I wanted to give you on the lightscape. So if there's no questions or inquiries to go deeper, I will proceed to the favorite, my favorite part of the presentations, um, which is EBRD. So because I'm here speaking, I will do my preach, hoping maybe you apply uh, to our organization one day. Um, it was established in early 1990s, as I've mentioned. Currently, it's owned by 71 countries. As I mentioned at the beginning, those are the, the owners of, 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 of EBRD. And all, uh, so basically, they provide the financing to carry on all the things I've mentioned. Currently, we are still AAA rating. So what does it mean? We are subject to regulatory rating agencies. That means that our investments have to be profitable. Uh, and that's very tricky. Again, we can talk more about it later during the discussion, how to kind of get that balance right, there are trade-offs. How much of the profitability can you give up in order to do a bit more of the development work? And for us, it's transition, uh, which means transitioning the country investment to the country level outcome which brings the country to a fully functioning market economic model that's very expensive that conditions are attached things can go wrong so there's a bit of leverage uh, between that in terms of the structure of our shareholders as you can see eu is providing a lot so it's 54 percent and that what that means that when our board makes decisions for every individual investment by the way they have a lot to say. So if they don't want to have one project going ahead, their vote, vote counts. So you can imagine that my bank does a lot of green financing. As I mentioned at the beginning, EIB, the European Bank, we do a lot what EIB is doing because the EU sits on our board and takes large vo um, voice in the discussion. I think now we'll go to the fun bit. I know a bit about you here in the room, and I know that there are people from all over the world. And now you wonder, OK, I mentioned the post-Soviet regime, and you think, which would be our largest country of operation. Well, we have done a lot. As you can see, the volume of investments is huge. We have over 6,000 projects uh, as of summer this year, large, a large um, volume of lending. You can see a drop there, and that's because of the war in Ukraine. I mentioned at the beginning, it was the biggest country of operation. Unfortunately, um, well, obviously, fortunately, as, as, as they were involving, things were improving. Um, we were putting some frameworks there to provide, to lower the corruption, build, build infrastructure projects of the country to flourish. And now, obviously, with the tragedy of the war, um, we, we are doing more in Ukraine. Um, unfortunately, the big jump is that, obviously, there's very limited amount of donor financing available. We're doing quite a small, very small share of debt deals at this stage. We continue doing a lot of private sector, so 69 is our share currently. What it means that the remaining percentages is with public sector. 
we will give money to a public sector which will facilitate uh, private sector development and creation of competition and so on. And we do that rarely, but we do it in order to stimulate the, the, the economy to move uh, to the fully functioning market economic model. As you can see, we still do a lot of debt. Equity is there and it's growing. It's very difficult with current environment to do equity deals. Uh, we have guarantee, which actually picked up recently because we're doing more risk sharing facilities to provide financing to Ukraine and other affected country. And obviously want to cover our backs. So we're doing quite a lot of risk sharing facilities. Why I mentioned Ukraine is it's, um, it's because it used to be our biggest country of operation and then it dropped. And as of recently, actually pick up again. So now I make the three Turkish students happy because as of today, Turkey is the biggest country of operations in terms of volume. We invest there massively. It's a large, in, in, important country for us. Um, a lot of, we have a very strong regional office in Turkey. Um, lots of bank, very good bankers working there. Ukraine now picked up again. It's on the top of the list. Egypt, it's quite new. It, we, it was joining ABRD only 2015 and now become really important, as you can see, the third in terms of volume. Greece, it was always democracy. We wonder why is it on the list? I mean, there was never the Soviet regime there. It's because we adjusted our mandate as the institutions evolve over time. Uh, we decide not to talk about transition in terms of end products, but also about the quality. So as you remember the, the Greek financial crisis and, and the things we were preaching the line and Greece became a country of operation and we dealt with it in order to improve the, the, the economy and private sector then support the growth of the country after that crisis. Uh, Uzbekistan, obviously, it's, it's a very uh, stable uh, country where we always dealt with. Poland, where I'm originally from, is also a very important player for us and few others. Now, the funded, the map of the country. So as I mentioned, in, in, in originally we were, where you see the Central European uh, and Balkan states, we were pretty much focused there in early 1990s. As the time and war was spreading, we went more into Asian country. Then after the global financial crisis, we went down. Turkey, Egypt, um, Lebanon. As you can see, we, we are in multiple places. We are in Morocco, Lebanon. And as of earlier this year, um, and that actually that's one of the readings uh, I, I shared with you before this, um, we are thinking of expanding to Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, that's where lots of players already are. African Development Bank, European Investment Bank, uh, Chinese Development Banks are also there. Um, and obviously we'll have Kwan talking about Kenya. So hopefully we can talk more about the role of MDBs there and whether we are there for doing the right things uh, in the right way. We don't um, create maybe issue with absorbed capacity where we provide too much lending um, on wrong terms uh, and maybe not even be able to tackle the local specificity um, of each of the countries. But unfortunately, my bank could not go to Sub-Saharan Africa because we needed that capital back in Ukraine. That's why you should drop back to Ukraine. Uh, when the war happened, we mobilized and redirected lots of financing back to the original country um, and other affected country around, impacted by refugees from Ukraine, uh, food crisis now and so on. So we preserved that capital and decided to be politically ready to go to Sub-Saharan Africa one day in the future, but not now because we need the money somewhere else. And that brings me back to, to, to what we do in terms of how we define each other it's, itself. So our deals are defined by development outcome called transition. So you heard about this development outcome probably in different contexts. For us, this is transition. So if you hope, come for interviews to us, you must know what transition is. So for us, transition as of today is defined as a quality of transition to, towards uh, um, a, a strong private sector um, economy in, in a fully functioning market economic setup. And there are six of those qualities in terms of how competitive the market is, how well governed in terms of rule of law, um, control on corruption, accountability measure, and so on. Inclusion, and that tackles inclusion, for example, how many women sit on the board uh, or management of the firms, um, 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 and obviously the representation of different ethnic minorities in the firms as well. Integration in terms of interconnectivity, trade, uh, domestic international markets for good service and capital labor is very broad and it actually tackles uh, other qualities as well. Resilience, which is my favorite, because that's where I specialize in terms of resilience, in terms of financial stability, uh, but also economic diversification. Um, uh, and this is very much relevant today when we seeing the world, which is very turbulent. We had war on Ukraine. Now we had COVID year before. Something always happened. Unfortunately, as you know, from the latest projects from IMF and World Bank, global financial crisis is coming. Um, we're already feeling in our pockets with the inflation at the highest peak ever. 
So I think resilience for EBRD now is actually, there's lots of discussion whether we define it the right way. Ongoing discussion whether maybe we should make it more of a shock absorbed quality because at the moment is again, but a bit too positive and doesn't cover for results. As I mentioned before, we don't get the results there because we don't have the indicators for the projects to mention certain shock absorbing capacity of different projects. Uh, so there's a bit of work that uh, currently in the bank going on on how we define resilience and green. Uh, obviously, there are discussions across IFIs. Are we a green bank now? Almost 50% of our deals are green. Um, and, this, and some people say, actually, guys, you should not be there because that's what EIB is doing and doing, doing much better than you do. So green is a, it's, it's a big um, part of our investments at this stage. Um, and there are ongoing discussions within the IFI uh, uh, app, whether maybe we should just focus on policy and leave EIB to do the investments projects. Um, and in terms of in what way, that's what I'm going to speak to you next. Here, it's, it's, it's so imagine you have a project uh, in one of the countries you saw on the map uh, and you are a banker. So we have bankers and economists who design those projects with the client in the private sector. So you have to think about certain things. For example, is this project uh, going to bring the money back? So that's the sound banking principle of each of the investments and, and work EBRD does. If you have the tick on that, you can proceed. Transition impact, the development outcome um, uh, component is the most important. If you don't get that, then the board will not approve your projects. And unfortunately, all the work you did is not going to go ahead. And that's that's the trade-off which I mentioned. You may give up a bit of profitability to get a development outcome higher up, but it's very tricky and it's very delicate balance. And also you paid based on, on the success of your deals and the number of volumes you're signing, but also how the project the project uh, deal, dealt with. So it's a very tricky discussion between bankers and economists to get that balance right. And the most important now, and that brings to the whole variety of IFIs, which is growing still, is additionality. EBRD by default should not step in if there is already financing uh, available, especially for private sector. Um, that's ongoing discussion, <laughs> uh, whether, well, it's very difficult to quantify. There's uh, obviously non-financial additionality, financial additionality, and it's very difficult to, to put it in the board document for, for the investment um, and, and actually assess whether it's been assessed the right way. But by default, in order to get the deals through uh, a policy work, you have to have all the three components uh, in, in your project proposals. Next on this, uh, I hope I'm doing okay with time. Or oh, yes, okay, thank you. Um, just to mention here, um, yeah, I think that would be. Do you have any questions actually before I continue quickly talking about EVRD? Okay, no. Okay, in that case, I tell you a bit more before we, we, we close my remarks on the toolkit of, 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 of how we do it. So I mentioned you did your deal. When I say deal, I mean the commercial financing. That's the projects of investment projects within the EBRD, mostly debt for us um, or equity, as I mentioned. Um, uh, and it's most frequent, um, I mean, it's most common tool used uh, by, uh, by our bankers and economists. We also do policy dialogue with governments to prepare the ground uh, for, for, for private sector to nourish. For example, we, would we consult the government to build the regulatory frameworks in a given country, uh, advise them on, on uh, how to increase good governance and so on. Um, and uh, during the pandemic, we also specifically advise them how to tackle the, the, the response to the pandemic. We also do technical assistance projects, which tend to be more technical, but very important. Quite often, the technical assistance projects will prepare the ground for the uh, commercial financing to happen. And there's lots of associated uh, projects uh, between those, those two buckets. And then we also do confessional financing, uh, especially now a bit more uh, with the current crisis ongoing. And lastly, on the sector coverage, we do a lot. Uh, as you can see, not just green, as you may have assumed from my remarks. Um, historically, actually, we did a lot of FI uh, financial institutions with partner banks. And that's, again, with my expertise seats. And currently, I'm drilling deeper into the FI, uh, trying to see whether the money we provide to uh, banks uh, in that sector um, actually created impact uh, on our clients on the ground, in, in especially in Uzbekistan and Egypt. And so that's what I do on a day-to-day basis, trying to assess whether what we've given there actually created the, 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 the results we're hoping to achieve. Here's a very quick project case study, which is very random, but I just brought it up here uh, because uh, this project uh, with the Bank of Africa, BMCE, uh, was a, obviously it's, it's a huge bank in Morocco and, and it's an important play for that country. It's very large senior loan, which we given of 145 million euros. 
uh, focus was on providing uh, on lending for corporates and SMEs. Uh, and I mention it because it was the first investment under our uh, COVID-19 uh, response package called Resilience Framework. So that was basically a framework which I spent my last two years evaluating, um, which uh, which is now outlined here, uh, which basically involved 21 billions of, of, uh, of uh, EBRD capital provided to all of our country operations in order to help them tackle uh, the, the spillovers from, from what the COVID-19 pandemic brought to the lives of our clients in private sector, but also non-clients. And the main new innovative uh, elements were the resilience framework we could see that with 75 projects being signed. Uh, so my work, uh, work as an evaluator, what I did for the last one, um, almost two years at EBRD, evaluated this program, especially the resilience framework, trying to see whether the bank did the right thing in terms of structuring the deal, in terms of the speed of putting this in practice. Obviously, well, as I mentioned at the beginning, when you have the deal resigned, it takes time to get it approved by credit department, dispersed to the client's pocket, so it actually creates some impact. And all of this time during crisis like COVID and now on Ukraine matters. So I was assessing the speed of implementations, also remembering that there are deals and you have to bring uh, some profitability back um, so it, it's, it's ongoing assessment, especially now in the second phase where I drew deeper building and counterfactual impact evaluation model. Um, but we can have a discussion about it later on if you're interested. Um, and um, just to finish quickly on the video here, when you have your spare time, I'm happy to share my slide in PDF. You can click on that link. There's a video summary with my voiceover, which summarizes what the work I did for the last one year and a half um, in the first. And you can also read the report analyzing what the bank did for, for the pandemic. And here's just seven minutes of a video you can watch in your spare time. And now in the remaining few minutes of my time, I'll just quickly finish on the challenges the, the IFI architecture faces. There's lots of things I could mention, and obviously, obviously, half of it is, is uh, because I'm currently working for both for IMF and for for EBRD. I cannot really speak uh, before some products are spelled out, but I can definitely reference to the annual meetings which just finished a few weeks ago here in Washington D.C., uh, where you probably overheard the gloomy picture where the glo global cri crisis is coming. Fortunately, it will get a bit worse before it improves. But there are some major things on the horizon which everyone is now thinking of battling. Obviously, climate change was there before, and, and and it remains to be there. It's a huge challenge of how to finance it and how to tackle. Maybe some of you follow the COP27 in Egypt uh, just a couple of weeks ago as well. That was obviously on the top of mind, mind uh, people's mind whether uh, there are all the firms which think they're doing well, they actually may be doing a bit of greenwashing there. Uh, inflation is impacting you and me, everyone. Um, US actually did very well last week when there was a, actually some results coming up that it's, it's, it's getting a bit better, to which, as you probably heard, if you have some stocks, they improved for a bit, but uh, unfortunately, uh, still, it's not the good times we remember before um, before the, the, the this crisis um, moments uh, in our lives. Crypto security is just because lots of banks are, are worrying about that. It's, even in private sectors, uh, it's also a threat uh, for organizations to make sure we tackle it for our clients, but also in our computers, we get lots of pitch emails. You have to be very careful you don't click on because lots of hackers want to get to the systems of those organizations and, and try to you know break the flow and, and doing good for the global development. I uh, also wanted to especially uh, mention fragmentation risk. Uh, which is important because, as we see, the war in Ukraine, uh, huge issue with geopolitics between uh, China, US, and so on. Uh, there is obviously a, a huge increase of populism as well. So there, there is an ongoing debate in the industry that you know, the, all the hard work we did for globalization is going to be reversed now, and countries will become very much close in, um, and all of the work on the global financial system will you know, fragment and, and things will crack. Um, and obviously that will not be good for the economies as a, as a whole. So that's, especially for IMF, you can read a lot about the policy briefings on this topic, and it's definitely in the mind of economies working at the fund. National and corporate debt issue, big, also a big challenge for me at EBRD as well. That's my next project uh, next year. I will drill deeper into non-performing loans. So there are the corporate debt uh, you know, elements where uh, loans are not profitable. Uh, and there's this, obviously at the moment is went, wait and see on NPLs. Lots of countries, especially in Europe, did a very good job on the regulatory frameworks, but there is a possibility of a spike in NPLs. Uh, and we need to see whether the resolutions which are in place are fit for purpose uh, when we see those um, uh, those NPLs uh, on uh, on the horizon, crisis upon crisis is again you see food crisis you hear in in many countries in Africa especially um, refugees crisis humanitarian disasters it's something is always happening somewhere in the world and we can maybe have some discussion about that uh, in in the Q and A. 
Um, capital frameworks are very specific. It's just that it matters for me as well. Uh, how to free more capital for lending? Uh, donors are a bit constrained. Uh, people wonder whether we can free some capital which is left on buffer. And there's ongoing discussions in the MDB work lab how to reform it uh, following some G20 report, which was issues on that. It's very technical, uh, but um, I think it's one of the things I provide you to read. So we can discuss this later if you have read that. Um, and I will finish on that because I know we run out of time and I look forward to, talk, to hear the other speakers doing them right and then we have a joint discussion. Thank you so much, Natalia. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. And now I would like to invite Juan to, to make his contribution here. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I just want to give a warning. I'm at the moment in Kenya, uh, not even in Nairobi. Um, I'm in Embu, it's a small town at the foot of the Mount Kenya. And the uh, internet, unfortunately, is not very stable. So if it drops, I, I apologize in advance if, it, if the internet drops. Um, right, um, I'm going to, to talk about the smallholders irrigation project, which is this uh, small SIM3. The smallholders irrigation project has uh, four phases. I'm the program manager of the fourth phase, and uh, I'm going to talk about the exposed evaluation of the phase three. Um, just uh, first, first of all, a little bit of a disclaimer. You know, the expression, the, the opinions that I'm going to express here are, are my own. And uh, the financier of this uh, project, which is KFW, the German Development Bank or HD Group, uh, do, do not have anything to do with it. It's uh, my opinion based on my experience working in this project. Um, the presentation that I'm going to deliver is based on these two papers. Uh, the export evaluation of the phase two, one and two and the phase three. And the data is uh, publicly available in the KFW website. So you can, you can search for these papers and read in more details what I'm going to present. Uh, right, a bit of a background where, where this project is, the small holders irrigation project. Oh, one more thing <laughs> before I continue. Um, I'm not an academic. I'm an engineer implementing projects. And uh, I'm going to talk from my experience of being in the ground, uh, implementing these projects. Uh, I'm also not a social scientist. So some of my appreciations on the social sciences are, are just that appreciations. And yeah, just please bear in mind that I'm, I'm just an engineer. So where this project is, this project is in East Africa, in Kenya, and the Mount Kenya region is just here in the center of the country, here, center of the country. And the project involves four counties, the counties of Meru, Tharakaniti, Embu, and, um, Embu, Tharakaniti, Meru, and Kirinyaga. Um, the overall goal of the program is to improve the living conditions of the farming population in the program area. So in these four counties that I mentioned before, uh, by increasing agricultural production through the provision of additional irrigation facilities and services. As I mentioned before, this program has four phases. I'm the program manager of the fourth phase, which is now being implemented since 2017. And the first phase started in 2005, so 18 years ago. This quite, since it's been implemented for quite a long time, there is a lot of uh, lessons learned through this uh, 18 years of implementation. Um, the program is designed as an open program in which individual irrigation schemes are identified, are designed, are built, and then hand over to the beneficiaries, which are co cooperatives. Um, 
Then the cooperative has to assume the responsibility for running the schemes and they just continue basically on, on their own. Um, the, I'm going to talk a little bit later on the selection of these uh, um, cooperatives or groups, but basically they need to apply for the program and then there is a selection process. And once the selection process is finished, um, those, those uh, cooperatives are taking over to a, a process that leads to the, uh, leads to a, the, the construction of the scheme and then they take over. For that, they need to, to pay for the irrigation scheme. And uh, I'm going to explain later how, how that works. The program has uh, three components. The first component is a, a component of small holding in construction, which is the engineering part. The component two, the participatory irrigation management is more capacity building. Um, the component three, which is where I sit, is the, um, the program management and the management of all the funds and, and contract, contractual issues and so on. Um, yeah, the farmers' cooperative must, must apply and fulfill a set of requirements for, for to qualify for the program. Uh, that is, first, they need to constitute a cooperative or self-health group, or it's called self-health group. Um, then the self-health group is, to, is turned into a cooperative uh, that must fulfill the, the Kenyan legislation, that is, to, be, to fulfill the requirements of the Kenyan Act, the Cooperative Kenyan Act. Um, then they need to pass what is called a ROSA, a rapid on-site assessment, where we look at things like uh, where the scheme is sit or will be sit, where the cooperative is in, in terms of the geography, uh, where the intake of water in which river might be, how far is this intake uh, to the irrigated area, the, the potentially irrigated area, if there is a difference in, in level, because these schemes are designed uh, of naturally uh, natural pressurized naturally by gravity, um, then the cooperative needs to be willing to take up a loan corresponding to 50% of the construction cost of the scheme, with three year grades and five years to maturity at 12%. And that's this is important because this is one of the key aspect of this program. Um, the, the construction cost of the scheme, 50% uh, is given to the farmer as a grant from the Kenyan government, and the remaining 50% it's a loan. So the farmers need to take up a loan and pay for the infrastructure. In order to be able to apply for a loan, they need to raise a 10% of the estimated cost of contraction and deposit in a bank as a, as a loan security, as a guarantee before taking up the loan. Um, this is very important because they will have some, I will explain later, it has some, some good consequences for the, for the project. Um, the demand of the programs, uh, the demand for the program support is, is, is quite high. It's been always high, it's been always high. The first, the first phase, when there was no experience of the project, um, there was no, the, the, the cooperatives didn't know what to expect, why they had to loan, apply for a loan and so on. Now, once the first phase was finished and it was successful, the farmers saw that they had um, and the irrigations can be that's one other cooperatives that started applying and the program became very very popular um for in the phase three out of 27 cooperatives only four were selected to develop as irrigation schemes and in the phase four which is still we are implementing now out of a total of 126 cooperatives that apply only six were selected um it's a very competitive process to be selected to, to take a new rig, to, to be developed as a new regulation scheme. Uh, and of course, you have to be because the funds are not illimited. We have a limited of funds, and uh, we need to be sure that the schemes that are taken to construction are going to be um, successful in terms of paying the loan and developing to um, work, in, work 
in agricultural um, enterprises. This export evaluation is based on the development assistance committee methodology of the Organization for the Economic and Cooperation and Development. Um, so this graph that is there, I took it from the OACD website, which is there, and uh, there is a tons of uh, good, good information and documents in that website. So if you're interested in the evaluation of uh, projects, I would strongly recommend it to visit the website and have a look at it. Um, it's based on six those six criteria, relevance, coherence, effectiveness, sustainability, impact, and efficiency. Um, each of these criteria aims to answer a question what is there. So, so this expert evaluation, um, the successfulness of the project and all in any of these uh, criteria, relevance, effectiveness, efficiency, it's been assessed in six levels, as described there, from very good and good and good results to uh, uh, no impact of the situations that are very deteriorating. Um, so, in terms of relevance, so is the intervention, the project doing the right thing? Um, as I said before, the objective of the program was to improve the living conditions of the farming populations in the program area by increasing agricultural production. Um, there's two key aspects for this, for this, uh, this relevance. The increase in productivity, and this is, this is actually in the Kenyan agricultural sector development strategy. This increase in productivity commercial, by commercialization and competitiveness and the development and managing uh, key factors of production. So, the country's strategy, the, the Kenyan country strategy, is to, to lead ag agricultural growth and development through intensification and substitution of, of crops towards high value crops and the expansion of the cultivated area through irrigation. So, this increase in productivity, commercialization, and competitiveness in the development and management of the key factors of production is what we are aiming. To, to address with this project. Um, the project also intends to transform rain-fed agriculture, traditional rain-fed agriculture or orders into irrigated market-oriented agriculture uh, by financing the development of more to medium-sized irrigation scheme. It's not only the infrastructure, it's also producing a quality change in the, um, in the, in the farmers' groups. Um, all this will become clear with all the other all the other uh, concepts that we're going to look at later. Um, high revenues from the the high value crops increase farmers farm and household income and improve living conditions. This is one of the one of the changes that has been uh, observed, and the variety of cultivated crops in house has better has provided better and varied nutrition because they're not limited only to what kind of crops they can grow in rain-fed rain agriculture. So how is this program relevant? Well, the, the project is relevant since addresses those issues and produces a change. And also is the, the program is in line with Kenyan development policies, in particular the food security and job resilience program and the Kenyan private sector development program in agriculture. It's not a program sitting on its own in Kenya, but it's part of a broader uh, policy um, towards the agricultural development in Kenya. Um, effectiveness is the intervention achieving its objectives. Well, the, the the easiest way to see if the, the project is, uh, is reaching uh, or is, is, is actually achieving its success is to look at the irrigation area. So where there was an area not irrigated, you can go three years later and see that actually there is irrigation. And there is irrigation production. Uh, in production and irrigation. 
Um, some farmers they have even complemented the, the irrigation infrastructure built uh, with some on-farm storage for, um, for sorry, rain, rain, harvesting rainwater or even the water that they get uh, through the system during periods of, uh, of abundance of water, the storage in, in, in farm, on the farm. Uh, so irrigated the area, uh, cropping intensity, there's been a change from 166% to 220% in the cropping intensity. Um, although this only provides an indication of the quantity of produce being produced, but not on the quality. And I will address this in, in a second. And the average annual biomass. So the, if one can increase, if one can measure the increment in, in the annual biomass, then there has been, uh, an, the, the intervention has achieved the objective of producing more. Um, and in fact, there's been an increase in the, in the biomass because it was measured between 2000, in the year 2000, um, in the period between 2000 and the year of such irrigation, which is 2014, 2015, and the year 2014, 15, and 2018. Um, yeah, the estimated increase in the biomass is between six and eight, but uh, six and ten percent. Um, okay, in terms of the increase in, in in the area irrigated, these are the four irrigation schemes under the phase three, and then one can see here the number of households and the project area, the irrigated area. This is phase three between in phase one and phase two. The, the sizes of the irrigation scheme were smaller. In phase one, which was the first, the first phase, um, the, the size of the scheme was between 40 hectares and 100 hectares. Um, this was changed in 2008 when it was introduced the phase two, and it was increased. And that also increased the efficiency of use of resources, especially the mining resources. Um, Carrier there, you see that it's a small irrigation project, 60 hectares, and that was because originally there was another irrigation scheme which was bigger, but they couldn't raise the 10% security fund, so they couldn't go into construction. And then this was a substitute, they introduced as a substitute, and it was a small. Right. Um, This is in terms of uh, cropping intensity. So what I can see here, uh, this is with our project and this is with project for, for two irrigation schemes, Kandu and Mitohin. Um, with, with our project, there was a quite high proportion of beans and quite high proportion of maize. Now with irrigation project, there is a shift here. And there's a shift toward high value crops. You can see bananas increase here at 12%, from 7 to 12%. There is a reduction in beans from 29 to 10% to a third here. Coffee maintains more or less the same because coffee is a, is a perennial and there's quite a bit of investment to, to, to start a coffee plantation. So there was no change. Uh, maize is also a reduction. Um, maize and beans are the two crops that are the staples in, in Kenya. Um, these are the crops that are grown uh, under rainfed agriculture, and basically, it's, it's the, the base, the basis of the, the uh, Kenyan um, food, the staple food. Um, so, although there's been a reduction. It has not disappeared. Um, a similar trend, similar situation we have here with uh, in between, where there's been a reduction from 22% to 14% uh, in beans. There's an increase from almost nothing to 10% in bananas and 55% to a reduction to 32% in maize. This is a quality change. So there's been a change, a shift from crops that uh, are under rainfed irrigation and has very little value to 
a more or a higher value of crops where they can they can provide some income, some uh, disposable income, some more cash in in the pockets of the farmers. Um, this is the share of crops in the irrigation uh, in Candio Amiduini. And this is in, uh, this is in percentage. So we have here uh, banana, and this is in 2018, yeah? So there is a high percentage of, of bananas here. Uh, Arrow wheat and baby corn are really almost nothing. Um, French bean, this is very interesting because this French bean and this, these beans, the beans that they usually crop are dry beans, are the beans that they get dry and they consume um, as a staple. French beans are beans that are sold green, fresh, and that has a very um, high value because it's exported. So this here, it's, it's very interesting, it, this, this change to a high value crop. Um, maize still remain with an important proportion because it's a staple of, uh, it's, a, it's, the, it's the staple that they eat. And also it's uh, sweet potatoes, yeah, in Mituhin. Um, right, total biomass. Um, the total biomass, how was estimated that actually there was a, a change or an increase in production of biomass? From the year 2000 to the year 2015, with satellite images that was measured uh, the biomass produced in the area. And it was compared with uh, the, the, those farms in phase four that were not turning to irrigation yet. So phase three farms after three or four years of production compared the same farm with the phase four, uh, which are in the same body, the same region. And then it was measured the difference so before the entry in, in production, which was in 2015, the variation was almost constant. However, after the irrigation, there's a, a very low peak here. Um, this is due to perhaps um, a start irrigation, they introduced the technology, the farmers need to get used to new technology, but once they got the new technology more or less adjusted, the biomass production increase. Biomass production means um, that the, there's been a, more production of green material, so that can be measured through the um, through satellite images. Um, right, the support of farmers to find access to the market was lower in the phase three than in the phase two of the project. Um, the, the, the farmers can produce um, agricultural producers because they are because of that, because they are farmers and they've been farming traditionally for years and years and generations. So all what is related to production is very well known to them. However, what, what they do after the harvesting, so commercialization, uh, contracts, and other things, is, is not new, but it's more difficult to them to, um, to successfully um, implement or successfully uh, negotiate some products. Between, in phase, uh, in phase two, there was the support of GIZ, the, the German Development Agency, which was supporting the farmers in all the access to market, marketing, selling, etc. Uh, but in phase three, the GA said uh, retrieved because there was this devolution from the government, the Kenyan government, to the counties. And um, it was thought that the counties should take over that, that task in order to ensure long-term sustainability. Um, the county has some county offices, officers for irrigation and the link between the local authorities and the farmers would create long-term sustainability for the, for the irrigation scheme. 
Um, unfortunately, the the county offices doesn't have the means to do that. And with the mean, I mean the financial means, uh, transport, uh, per diem, etc. So it's it was um, it's, it's difficult for them to do that. Um, most farmers market their produce individually, um, and others like me too, they market bananas collectively as a cooperative. Um, and this is a very interesting case. Mituini in 2015, the Corti produced for, for 41 tons of bananas with a revenue of 6,700 euros, uh, 6,500 euros. And in 2018, the same cooperative produced 417 tons, which is a revenue of 67,000. So this is this is another of the of the um, areas to work with, uh, with this cooperative. And this is the support I was uh, talking earlier. Um, if, the, if the farmers could work together, could negotiate together, they can get not only better prices, but better contracts for production and better access to market and so on. Um, they can also classify bananas and send the prime uh, quality bananas to one market and uh, lower quality to a local market, a regional market as well. Um, most of the producers are sold in the local or national market. I'm not saying local market, I'm saying market in the, at the council level or region level or national markets basically in Nairobi. Um, and as I said before, only French beans are sold to brokers who actually export um, these, these beans. Um, a major factor of success of the program is the financing scheme of the irrigation infrastructure with a 50% loan portion and a 50% grant portion. The loans in the loan cooperative, this created this, this financing schemes create sense of ownership and developing a saver culture. And this is, this is key for the success of this program. Because since the farmers, as a cooperative, they need to, to raise 10% security fund in order to apply for the loan. And then they need to pay for the loan that they take up for their own infrastructure. That created from the very early stages of the program, they create a sense of ownership and says that they are working to build something that is their own. Um, and also develop a saving culture because they need to contribute to a fund, a cooperative fund, and raise the money towards, towards the goal, which is the 10% security. Then they have another goal, which is to pay for the loan of infrastructure. And then by the time that the Paying for the for the infrastructure is, is accomplished. That that uh, culture of saving of contributing is is already there. It's already part of the working method of the of the cooperative. And then they keep saving and they they keep paying into the the pot of the cooperative for operational maintenance for other things like uh, uh, in, improving and making some investment. Um, another factor of success of the finance schemes was the strict rule of the cooperative regarding payment obligations and consequences for payment, payment delays. No free riders. And that's a, another important aspect. There's no free riders. If you don't pay, if you don't fulfill your payment obligations, there is a warning. Uh, after the warning, they they're trying to be understanding, see what's going on. If there's still no payment, there's another more serious warning. And in the end, if if the farmers do not fulfill their payment obligations, are basically more severe sanctions, which could lead to losing the rights to be to be in the cooperative and also to withdraw the rights or to withdraw the, the, the rights to irrigate. And that uh, water, that connection is given to another farmer who take up the, the, the debt of the, the, 
the previous uh, farmer and continue with the payment. And it's, it's interesting that as soon as there is somebody with a payment delayed, um, there is people expressing interest in taking over the, the right for irrigation. And this is because once you have an irrigation system in place and it's working, you see that it's working. So it's, there's no risk involved in saying, okay, I want the irrigation right from this guy, I paid and you know, I get it. The only, the only problem is, of course, to connect to the pipe. It's just to, to make the connection to the pipe, that might be some small work to be done. Depends where the, the farm is located, but there is no, no real risk. While at the beginning, when there is nothing, the farm needs to start contributing and saving with nothing in place, the, the risk for them is, is much higher. Um, so there's no, no problem in finding a replacement for somebody who is not paying. That's, that's why this rule is very strict. Efficiency. So how well are resources being used? And resources here refers to monetary resources, financial resources. Construction cost in phase one was 3,650 euros per hectare. Phase two, 3,157, slightly lower. Phase three, 3,140. Uh, this is way lower than the National Irrigation Board, the Kenyan National Irrigation Board average cost, which is 5,400 per hectare. Um, there's a lot of considerations in the cost of uh, building these schemes. Um, now we're implementing phase four and we're about get the construction cost for the phase four. But my expectation is that the construction cost for phase four will be way much higher. And this is because cost of pipe has increased as uh, Natalia mentioned before, war in Ukraine, uh, increase in the oil prices, uh, uh, PVC pipes uh, are very oil prices or follow the innovation. Oil prices has increased a lot. Cost of transport with the, any increase on oil prices, the cost of transport, transport increases. Um, I don't know if there will be another COVID lockdown. We, I hope not, but uh, this type of um, factors has uh, implications on the cost of the construction of the irrigation schemes. And, and also national policies. Uh, Kenya in recent months, even before the elections of August this year, uh, they start uh, reducing or withdrawing subsidies to petrol, which petrol has in, petrol cost has increased a lot. And that increases not only the, not only the cost of transport, but also any other costs or the or the cost of other services as well. So it's, uh, yeah, the, 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 the cost of the construction for phase four, I expect that they will be higher. How much higher, I still don't know. Um, consulting cost, the, the component one that I talked earlier, uh, involved the design of uh, irrigation schemes. Um, this is, subcontracted to a subconsultant design subconsultant who does this design. In the phase three, this uh, consulting cost was higher due to a administrative problem. There was a, a delay in signing this uh, subsidy loan agreement for the implementation of the, the fund that I was talking earlier. Um, and that meant that there was a, a, a delay and a longer um, a longer implementation cost of the consultants. And also, as I mentioned, substitution of, uh, of Kirene, which they didn't fulfill the requirement of 10% for carrier and irrigation schemes. So that meant that there was an additional um, extra or extra cost for designing the scheme. Um, 
phase two had a high cost of design consultant than phase three, and that was because the in phase three there was only one consultant designing all the irrigation scheme, and it was much easier for the the management of the project to deal and to administrate the the design and implement the, the, the design. In phase two, there was some um, Kenyan consultants doing it, but there were many, and some of them didn't perform well, and then the design took longer. Um, and as I said, counties, county irrigation officers supervise these extension services, but they do not have the capacity to do so, uh, and specifically, they don't have the, the resources, financial resources to mobilize from one place to another and deliver the, the uh, extension of the irrigation. Um, impact. What difference does the intervention make? Um, well, the, the, the biggest impact is actually providing irrigation water, which means to increase the number of crops per, per year. That is in related to the cropping intensity I was talking earlier, so from perhaps two poor crops per year following the, the two rainy seasons in Kenya. Now they could have up to two and a half or yeah, two and a half uh, crops per year. I'm saying two and a half because the third one you go into the, the other year. So it wouldn't be a complete a complete crop in, in, in the year. Um, has allowed also, the, the, the fact that they have now access to water, more reliable source of water, they have the possibility to, to go for other type of crops, more high value crops uh, that brings more uh, money and also increase the variety. Uh, what we've seen here is that with rain for agriculture, it's mainly maize um, and beans. And now with the water for irrigation, they can go into other type of pro uh, crops, uh, which means that they can have a variety and then uh, the variety means a variety for selling and the variety also for them to, to eat. And that is in relation to what I was talking earlier when I said that the, what, I've been, what I've been seeing is that the farmers with this uh, type of intervention, they have a better nutrition because they can only also have a small, um, like a kitchen garden where they grow their own for, for the house. And that's, that's improved their own nutrition. Um, the main change must come rather from the crops changes to cash crop in addition to stable crops. That means that the, the, the change in the, in the income, although they keep the stable crop because that's what they, they eat, they keep eating dry beans and maize. Um, they also shift into cash crop like bananas or macadamia or other type of crops, allow them to, to have a, a higher income. Uh, increasing production has created more seasonal jobs. If you have your, your parcel, um, you have two and a half crops per year uh, crop cultivated, then you need help to uh, harvest, to do the work in the, in, the, in the farm and then create some seasonal jobs. And also the cooperative have created five to seven family jobs on this, uh, some, some job for the, for the management of the irrigation scheme and the operation of the um, Also some of the farmers have, have reported that they have become self-employed, self-employed farm by having irrigation water and being able to cultivate more and to change into more uh, high, into high value crops that requires perhaps more labor. And then they have also uh, become a self-employed uh, farm. Um, a main core benefit 
actually we're not looking for this, but it's there, is the availability of water supply for domestic consumption and animal husbandry. The, this is not the purpose of the program. The program intends to provide uh, ir water for irrigation. But in rural uh, Kenya, where the source of water for a small village is, is perhaps three or four kilometers away um, down in the valley, where mostly kids go to down the river and carry a, a jerry can with uh, 10 liters of water and he has to have to walk a few kilometers back and forth. So if you are if one can supply through a pipe water for irrigation, of course they're going to use this water for water supply. So we have asked them uh, how to, to deal with them and say, oh no, we boil them or sometimes they use some purification tablets. Uh, but although this is not the intention of the program and we still remind the farmer that this is not what we intend to do. It's inevitable that they do it. Um, another impact seen is the increase in school attendance. And this is because the farmers, as soon as they have more disposable income or more um, cash in their pockets, one of the first things they do is to pay the school fees so the kids go to schools and improving in housing conditions and transport, that is the purchase of a motorcycle or a car, some, some, some things like that. Um, suspend sustainability. Will the benefits last, the benefit of this intervention? Um, well, cooperatives are still fully functional after three or four years of the uh, handing over of the schemes to them. Uh, these groups are audited under the Kenyan Cooperative Act. Uh, they have an elected management committee. Uh, they have an operational management system in place with trained staff. Um, and members contribute monthly to the operational maintenance of the cost of the system. So it's, it's a working group. It's a work group that after um, the program finish, after the irrigation scheme has uh, been built and transferred to them, they still function, they still work, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a functioning group. Um, as the project helped farmers to become bankable as a group or, or as an individual, they are planning for further investment in transport, storage, and processing facilities. And this is also an, an outcome of this saving cultures uh, mentioned before. Um, farmers understand the benefit of saving, of putting a little bit of money aside, and then they can um, plan further investment, uh, either for transportation or a storage facility for, for their produce. Also for buying inputs like fertilizers and, and uh, pesticides, um, as a group, they can get a much better uh, price um, by doing that. So these are not the, the benefits. Um, one of the threats to the sustainability of the schemes is the reliability of water availability in rivers. Uh, and I'm referring here to climate change impact on rainfall. All these rivers depends on rainfall uh, for their flows and illegal water obstructions in the catchment. Um, these farmers, they need to apply for uh, an obstruction license from the river, and then they have to pay and they're monitored by the water resource authorities. While illegal obstructions are completely out of the radar of authorities. What happens is when the river flows drops in the, in the river, um, then legal obstruction, obstructions are registered, are sometimes shut down because the priority is given to water supply for, for water treatment plants and for drinking um, water for, for, for urban areas. Um, while the legal abstraction, because they are 
either the rudder of the system, then they can keep obstructing the water. So this is a serious problem with the illegal obstruction. Um, a, the use of more efficient irrigation system, either drips or the use of on-farm storage is actually a, an advantage that can be implemented further. Drip irrigation uh, requires less water than the designed or implemented spring irrigation. And on-farm storage allows to provide some water during some dry spell, although it wouldn't provide a long-lasting solution. Vandalism is another problem. Uh, the vandalism on, for example, uh, metal materials like cover of manholes and stuff like that uh, are usually vandalized, are stolen for selling for scrap metal. And that is, is, is a problem. Irrigation discipline, so the use of spring, the use of horses rather than sprinkler, sometimes they put a, a pipe and the pipe can deliver more water as less friction, so they can deliver more water and then create some imbalances in the system. Rational use of water resources, meaning sometimes they just put the system to irrigate in the afternoon, they go away, come back the following day in the morning, and there's been applied much more water than what they actually the crop needs. Um, and for that, it's, it's important training. Uh, in terms of sustainability, the, 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 the system has been rated as, as successful. So key findings. The key findings of this uh, post evaluation, post implementation evaluation is the project is, is high, has a high efficient, efficiency test. So increasing crop intensity, shifting to more high value crops, harvest and production models continuously. That is, there is more than the two um, cropping systems that can be obtained by the, the using rainfall and rain, the rainfall agriculture. And it's more reliable because once the farmers do not depend on the rainfall during the rainfall season or outside the, rain, the rainy season, but they, they irrigate so they can produce more. You can shift to high value crops that bring more cash. It's highly relevant because the project is in line with the Kenyan development policies and it's a high demand from smallholders. It's been proven it's successful. It's been proven it's successful because the farmers can just go and see it see that the neighbor that was in the, in the cooperative actually got irrigation and we can produce more. And it's sustainable. The farmers cooperative have a function structure, although, as I mentioned, there are some threats and the most critical one is over attraction from rivers and climate change that could reduce potentially the resource of water. Um, the key findings, again, the overall rating of the phase three was successful too, and the, the phase two was satisfactory three. It was a, a little bit um, less, less successful, if you put it this way, uh, because of uh, the withdrawal of uh, GIZ and the problems with, uh, uh, with the, 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 the training and capacity building. Um, and that was it for me. Thank you very much for your attention.